the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a doctrine that divides people into one of two different groups. The first group is made up of those who believe that Jesus rose up from the grave just as the Bible revealed. The second group, well, it includes those who don't believe in this. It was April 2017 when the BBC released a report that revealed how the people of Great Britain are divided right down the middle regarding the question of Christ's resurrection. But now before you begin to think that 50% of the Brits actually believe in the biblical account of the resurrection, it's also important to note that the same survey goes on to reveal that only 17% of them actually believe that the Bible presents us with an accurate account of the Lord's resurrection. In other words, there's 50% of the Brits who believe in the resurrection. They just don't believe what the Bible says about the resurrection. Not only that, but the same survey also reveals the surprising news that one quarter of the people who describe themselves as Christians in Great Britain do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now get your mind around that one for a moment. A quarter of those who claim to be Christian in Great Britain reject the doctrine of Christ's resurrection. And while there are some who would suggest that this survey only goes to show that there's a large number of Christians who reject the resurrection of Christ Jesus, I must insist that this survey actually helps us to see that a quarter of the people in Great Britain who claim to be Christian aren't. A quarter of the people in Great Britain who claim to be Christians, they aren't Christian. And the reason why I say this is due to the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. And with that being the case, a born again believer would never reject the doctrine of the resurrection. Without debate, the doctrine of Christ's resurrection is able to reveal those who truly embrace the Christian faith and those who don't. Not only that, but the resurrection of Jesus reveals many other things as well. As a matter of fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ also reveals God's perfect plan for those who truly trust in him. And as we make our way through the scriptures before us this morning, well, we'll begin to see, first of all, that the promise of resurrection reveals the hope of inheritance. Secondly, we'll learn that the promise of resurrection also reveals the joy of endurance. Thirdly, and finally this morning, we'll see that the promise of resurrection, it reveals the goal of obedience. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Here we find Peter. He's encouraging the original recipients of this epistle to focus their attention on the revelation of of the resurrection. And as you make your way to 1 Peter chapter 1, I should take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll first help you to remember that the Apostle Peter wrote this letter to a group of Jewish believers who had fled from the land of Israel. And they fled in order to escape the persecution that was targeting the Christians of the first century. Now, it's possible that they were attempting to escape the attacks of the Emperor Nero, which began around 64 AD. But it's also possible that Peter was writing to the Jewish believers who had fled from Israel earlier in 44 AD as King Herod Agrippa I began his persecution of the Christians there in Jerusalem, which actually resulted in the beheading of James. Well, regardless of when the original recipients of this epistle were initially dispersed into the Gentile world, what we do know is that P Peter here, he begins this epistle with a word of encouragement and he begins by reminding them that they were the elect of God. We saw that in our study last week. Not only that, but now it's here in our text today where we find Peter. He's reminding his readers about the way in which the resurrection of the Lord Jesus has revealed the hope of our inheritance. And with this as our focus, let's consider how the apostle puts it here in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 3, here Peter writes... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now here in these verses, we find Peter encouraging his audience to 
refocus their attention. And he's encouraging them to refocus their attention on the resurrection. Now, as we continue to make our way through this epistle, I believe that many of the encouragements that we find in this epistle, they lead me to believe that the original recipients were probably uh, believers who were filled with fear. The reason why I say this is due to the fact that the escalation of persecution there in the first century, it led them to flee for their lives. And as a result, uh, they ended up becoming strangers in a strange land. They were no longer there in Israel. They were in the Gentile world. They were strangers or foreigners, as he put it in, in the first two verses of this epistle. They were foreigners in the Gentile world, and they were also concerned for their safety because the persecution of Christians was increasing. Without debate, this would have taken a lot of their attention as they feared for their lives. No doubt that they were concerned for their safety and it's for this reason that Peter set out to refocus their attention by taking their minds off of the persecution and putting their minds back on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He refocuses their attention on the salvation which will eventually be revealed at the time of Christ's return. Now, in order to understand why he here refers to their salvation as something that would be revealed in the future, it's important to remember that our salvation begins with the judicial justification which is decreed at the moment when we trust in Jesus Christ. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it's at that very second when you are justified. You are justified and decreed to be innocent in the eyes of God. This is the beginning of our salvation. But then our salvation also includes the purification of sanctification by which the born again is daily being transformed into the people that God wants us to become. That also is part of our salvation. Finally, our salvation culminates in the glorification that takes place at the time of the resurrection, which takes place in the last time as the bodies of every saint is raised up from the grave, and that's when we receive our new glorified bodies, which is the fulfillment of our salvation. Therefore, Peter here, he's encouraging his audience to stop focusing on the persecution of the day and to start focusing on the hope of salvation, which will result in our glorification. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 3. Here Peter again declares, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now let's just stop here for a moment here because here we find Peter, he's reminding his readers about this living hope that we have in Jesus. In Jesus we have a living hope. That word hope in this context it refers to the joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. And according to Peter, those who trust in Jesus, we have a living hope, which is another way of saying that we have a life-giving hope. And the reason why we have a life-giving hope is due to the fact that we have a living Savior who rose up from the grave after dying for our sins. We're not trusting in a dead Jesus. We're not trusting in a Jesus who was placed in a tomb and remained there. We have a risen savior and therefore we have a living hope. I like the way that Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's there where he assures his audience that Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Simply put, the resurrection of Christ Jesus, it provides us with the joyful and confident expectation that our risen Lord is able to provide us with eternal salvation through the power of his resurrection. And while it's true that God the Father is mercifully inviting every person to receive the living hope of everlasting life, it's also true that those who reject the Lord Jesus are living their life without a lasting hope. You see, those who reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ have no hope. They're living without hope or they're hopeless. In order to prove my point, let's look again here at 1 Peter chapter 1. I would draw your attention again to verse 3. Here Peter declares, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, the phrase here, which is translated begotten us again, it's rendered from a Greek word which shares the same root word as the word that Jesus used when he told Nicodemus that we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And so uh, the root word, which is translated born again there in John chapter three, it's, it's the root word that, that Peter's using here for the word begotten us again. And it's for this reason that the scholars who created the new living translation, they render verse three in this way, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. In other words, the hope of salvation is received by those who are born again. And we are born again by faith in Jesus Christ. Conversely, those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not born again and therefore they have no hope. Paul described this state of hopelessness in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he's describing the difference between the funeral for believers and the funeral for unbelievers. According to Paul, those who reject the resurrection of Jesus are filled with sorrow at the time of death because they have no hope. In contrast to this, those who believe that Jesus died and rose again, they're filled with hope. And the reason why is because we're able to look forward to the day when God will bring with him those who are already with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a pastor, I've done funerals for both believers and unbelievers. There's certainly sorrow at every funeral. And yet when I've officiated a funeral for a believer, there's that that sense of hope that we're going to see this person in the afterlife. Whereas the funeral for unbelievers, it's just sorrow and there is no hope. The born again believer has hope and our hope is in the promise of an everlasting inheritance. And as we consider the promise of inheritance, it's, it's not uncommon for many parents to want to provide an inheritance to their children at the time of their death. Sadly, though, there are times when an earthly inheritance ends up being worthless. For example, it was back in 2014 when an Italian woman named Claudia Moretti, she inherited 100 million lira banknotes that she found in her deceased uncle's safe. She thought that she had struck it rich until she discovered that the money was worthless. The reason why is due to the fact that Italy's currency was switched from the lira to the euro back in 2002. And so basically she had 100 million liar banknotes. They were worthless. And so the inheritance that was left behind for her was worth nothing. In light of this, it's important to understand that the earthly inheritance that we work so hard to leave behind, they could end up being worthless when our loved ones finally receive it. Not only that, but it's also important to understand that we can't take it with us. And if you're working really hard to build up your kingdom, thinking that one day you'll be able to, to haul you know, all of your wealth into heaven, it's not going to happen. No one enters heaven towing a U-Haul. You leave it behind. And listen, there's no transference of funds either from our bank here on earth to the storehouses there in heaven. You know, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be like we're, we're going to, you know, the, the, the first bank of heaven and saying, okay, all my funds are there, you know, on earth. Let's transfer the funds. Nope. It's not going to happen. And this might seem like a huge bummer as we realize that we can't transfer our earthly wealth, but Peter here assures us that the born again believer doesn't have to worry about it because we have a living hope, which includes an everlasting inheritance. And with this in mind, let's turn our attention now back to first Peter chapter one. I want to draw your attention back to verse three again, where Peter declares, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to what? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. In other words, the living hope of the born again believer is not only based on the promise of our resurrection from the grave, but we also have a hope that points us to this everlasting inheritance, which we're going to receive when we find ourselves there in the presence of our savior, Jesus. And according to Peter, our inheritance is first described as being incorruptible. It's incorruptible. In other words, it's never going to be 
devalued through decay. Secondly, he tells us that our inheritance is also undefiled, which means that it's never going to be reduced in quality or value. And then finally, he tells us that our inheritance will never fade away. And the reason why is due to the fact that this is a perpetual promise of an everlasting inheritance. We should also notice the word reserve, which is found there in verse four. There, again, Peter describes our inheritance as being incorruptible and undefiled and it does not fade away. And then he says that it's reserved in heaven for you. That's good news because listen, if somebody told me that I have an inheritance that's reserved for you in our nation's federal reserve, I wouldn't be too confident. The reason I say this is due to the fact that the Federal Reserve here in America has a hard time with the second word in that title. The Federal Reserve has a hard time reserving money. As a matter of fact, they currently have liabilities totaling more than $4 billion. And as a result, there's a constant threat of insolvency, which is just a fancy way of saying the Federal Reserve is close to being bankrupt. That being the case, if somebody were to say, I've got something reserved for you down at the Federal Reserve, I'd be like, well, we'll see. We'll see what tomorrow brings. You see, it's possible for an earthly inheritance to lose all of its value. Thankfully for us, the born again believer isn't hoping in an earthly reserve. We're not hoping in an earthly inheritance. The born again believer can rejoice today in the fact that we have an everlasting inheritance that God is reserving for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what this means is that the Christian now can have a joyful and confident expectation. We have our hope in something that is everlasting. Our hope is in the fact that the Lord is the one who is reserving for us a heavenly inheritance which we will receive and enjoy forevermore. While it's true that the resurrection of Jesus reveals this hope, it helps us to to see that we have this inheritance that's being reserved for us. It's also true that our hope of inheritance is based on his promise to preserve those who will receive the inheritance. Think about that for a moment. I mean, what if you had an inheritance that was reserved and waiting for you, but then you perished before you could receive it? Well, that would be a real bummer. But Peter tells us that that's not going to happen with the Christian. That the Lord's going to preserve us so that we can receive what he's reserved for us. As a matter of fact, let's consider how Peter puts it here in 1 Peter 1 verse 5. Here he assures his audience that Christians are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that word kept was translated from a Greek word which speaks of protection and also preservation. And it's for this reason that scholars who give us the New Living Translation, they render verse 5 in this way. Through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Simply put, the resurrection of Jesus provides us with the proof that Lord Jesus has the power to preserve those who trust in him. If Jesus hadn't risen from the grave, there would be no reason to believe that he's able to protect us. But because he has risen from the grave, because we can look at the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we can also believe that he has the power to preserve us until we receive what he's reserving for us. Paul sums it up best in Ephesians chapter one where he tells us, that the Holy Spirit of God has become the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, those who trust in the Lord Jesus have been sealed into their salvation by the Holy Spirit of promise. And in this way, the Holy Spirit of God has become the guarantee. He's become the earnest down payment. He's become the promised pledge. And and listen, as the Holy Spirit has been given to us as an earnest you know, money down payment, this actually contractually obligates God to provide us with the inheritance that he promised to provide. The minute he gave us the Holy Spirit at the, at the moment of our conversion, he contractually obligated himself to fulfill the promise that he made. 
With that being the case then, those who truly trust in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we can rejoice. We can rejoice because we know that we now have God's guarantee that we will receive a heavenly inheritance and in this we have hope. And while it's true that the promise of resurrection reveals the hope of our inheritance, it's also true that the promise of resurrection, it reveals the joy of endurance. But now what do I mean by the joy of endurance? Well, in order to explain what I mean, let's continue to make our way through 1 Peter, chap, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. If you would look with me there, we'll pick up our study at verse 6. Here Peter declares, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom... Having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now here in these verses, we find Peter referring to the various trials that the original recipients of this epistle had endured. Just to be clear, I should point out that the word trials, it's found there in verse 6. It's translated from a Greek word which refers to the adversity and the affliction that causes the Christian to experience times of trouble and tribulation. I'll remind you again, Peter is writing to a group of Jewish believers who had been forced to flee from the land of their inheritance and for no other reason than because they had believed in Jesus as the promised Messiah. And with that being the case, it's not hard to imagine that many of them were filled with grief as they left the land that they loved and as they were living in this Gentile world and everything was very strange and different to them. I, I'm certain that they were struggling with this trial. I'm guessing they were depressed because of the afflictions. As a matter of fact, look with me again there in the middle of verse 6. Here again, Peter tells us that the original recipients of the epistle had been grieved by these various trials. They were grieved. That word grieved, it speaks of sorrow, which is caused by suffering. Not only that, but it's also a word that speaks of the distress that we experience during times of great difficulty. So we see then that Peter, he's, he's writing this letter to those who were grieving. They were grieving over the fact that they were forced to leave the land of promise because of their faith in the promised Messiah. Well, knowing that their hearts were filled with grief, the Apostle Peter took the time to encourage his audience, and he did this by helping them to understand that the earthly trials that they were enduring, well, they were actually heavenly tests, which were designed to prove the faith of those who were truly trusting in Jesus. And in order to prove my point, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the Greek word, which is translated trials, it's again found there in verse 6, that word trials was not only used to describe the adversity and the affliction that occurs during times of persecution, but the same word was also used in reference to the tests that God uses to prove our faith as he's purifying us for his glory. As a matter of fact, look with me again, beginning at verse 6, where Peter declares, in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ now based on this we can see then that the various trials that we're suffering while we're waiting on the revelation of Jesus Christ, or while we're waiting on the return of Jesus Christ, we're suffering through all these trials. But Peter's saying, look, those trials, they're actually tests that God is using to prove the faith of those who trust in him so that we might be purified in the process. In order to illustrate his point, we find Peter here comparing these trials of life to the refiner's fire which was used for purifying gold. Now, in order to grasp this comparison that Peter is making between the, the, the trials of life and the refiner's fire, I want to take some time to consider the way in which a fire was used to, to purify precious gold from uh, the impurities that were hidden within. You might not know this, but gold is actually refined with flames of fire that reach temperatures that exceed 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a hot fire. In ancient times, the craftsmen would, would, would create this, this fire and then they would stir the molten metal, uh, uh, which would then allow the impurities hidden within that metal to, to rise to the top. 
those impurities, also known as dross, would then be skimmed from the surface, leaving behind the pure gold. But the only way to get those impurities to rise to the top so that it can be scraped off is by turning up the heat. You got to turn up the heat to get the impurities, you know, to, to be freed from uh, the precious metal. This is how gold is purified. And at the same time, the, per- the person who wants to purchase a bunch of gold, well, they would want to make sure that it was pure gold. And so they would also use the same process to test the gold. They would turn up the heat on the gold and they would see well, what kind of impurities are rising to the top. And then that would determine the value of the gold. Well, it's in a similar yet spiritual sort of way that the Lord uses the trials of life, the fires that we find ourselves in each and every day. He uses these trials by fire in order to reveal the quality of our faith as he takes us through this process of purification. Let's consider how the scholars who give us the New Living Translation render the beginning of verse 7. They put it like this. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Christian, listen, it's possible that you find yourself in the middle of a trial and and, and this trial that you're in the middle of, it's putting your faith to the test. This trial could be causing you to waver in your Christian faith. And it's possible that you're even beginning to question the love of the Lord and the goodness of God. And you're wondering, well, if God is so good, why is he allowing me to suffer in this sort of way? And if so, I would encourage you to just simply alter your perspective a little. You're looking at the trial as a punishment. You're looking at the trouble as something that God is using uh, to, to persecute you with. And if so, I would just remind you that the Lord uses the trials of life to refine your faith. He uses the trials of life to to remove the impurities of immorality. And not only that, but he's also using the trials in your life so that others can see the quality of your faith. Do you you understand that it's one thing to go to work and tell everybody that you're a Christian? It's another thing for them to see you leaning on the Lord as you endure every trial. The Lord wants to reveal the quality of your faith to others and the best way that he does that is through trials. Now with this perspective in view, Peter encouraged the original recipients to to, to simply look at every trial as an opportunity to rejoice. That's hard to hear. That we should look at a trial as an opportunity to rejoice? Now, the word rejoice, which is found there in the beginning of verse 6, it actually speaks of an exceeding amount of joy. It's not just joy, it's an exceeding amount of joy. Therefore, Peter here is essentially saying, you should rejoice with exceeding joy as you endure the trials of life. And the reason why is due to the fact that these trials are actually revealing to others that your faith in the resurrection is genuine, that you truly believe in the resurrection. I'm certain that we would all prefer a life of luxury. I'm certain that we would all prefer a life which is free from trials and tribulations. And yet we must remember that the trials of life are designed to remind us that we're actually looking forward to the resurrection. In order to prove my point, let's take another look at our text beginning at verse 6. Here again, Peter declares, in this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, You have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. Yet believing, notice, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
Here in these verses, we find Peter reminding his readers about the way in which the resurrection of the Lord Jesus has revealed the end of our faith, which, mind you, is the salvation of our souls. This, again, refers to the glorification of our bodies, which we'll experience at the time of the resurrection. Based on this, we can see that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus It it was designed to remind us that there's coming a day when we will see our Savior, the Savior that we don't see right now. We're going to see our Savior face to face, and we're going to stand before him, and we're going to proclaim his praises forevermore. Uh, Therefore, uh, what of the trials of today? Don't we already have victory over them in the promise of the resurrection? The trials that we are enduring today are designed to remind us that our hope is not here on earth. That our hope is in the afterlife. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in the resurrection. With that being the case, Peter encouraged his audience to refocus their faith to stop focusing on all the trials, stop grieving over the tribulations, but rather rest their faith on the promise of the resurrection because listen, the believer who is looking forward to the end of our faith, which results in our salvation through resurrection, well, those who focus our faith in this way, we're going to see the trials and the troubles of this world as simply an opportunity to rejoice. It's an opportunity to rejoice. The Christian who is focused on the resurrection revelation will easily be able to endure every tough trial. And the reason why is because those who are looking forward to the day when we receive our resurrected bodies, we're we're able to rejoice with inexpressible joy, realizing that we're not going to be stuck here forever. We're not going to be stuck in this body forever. We're not going to be stuck in this world forever. We have something to look forward to. This is the sort of joy that Paul was attempting to express in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where he assures his audience that God who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Christian, listen, those of us who are focused on the trials and troubles of this world, we're always gonna be filled with grief. And listen, if you're filled with grief, it's because you're focusing on the trials and the troubles of this world. Conversely, those who allow the trials and the troubles of this world to refocus our faith on the promise of the resurrection, we're gonna rejoice. And we're gonna rejoice with joy that's inexpressible as we realize that death has already been conquered by the king of life. And the trials that we're suffering today will soon be over. The victory that the Lord Jesus secured for us on the cross is already won. And therefore, I encourage you to realize that our resurrected Redeemer is able to empower us today so that we can endure every trial with inexpressible joy. So we see then the promise of resurrection reveals the hope of our inheritance and the promise of resurrection also reveals the joy of endurance. Finally, I want to consider how the promise of resurrection reveals the goal of obedience. And with this as our focus, let's continue to make our way through the first chapter of 1 Peter. If you would look with me there, we'll pick up our study at verse 10. Here Peter writes, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Now, uh, here in these verses we find Peter. He's reminding his readers about the way in which the Lord revealed the prophetic promise of the resurrection long before the arrival of the Messiah. 
And if you, and if you would notice again there in verse 12 where Peter writes, to them it was revealed. Now, uh, the word them there, uh, it's found in verse 12. To them, uh, the, the them is referring to the prophets that he mentions back in verse 10 where he describes the day when the prophets inquired and searched carefully as they prophesied about the grace that would come to us. And so Peter here is referring to the Old Testament prophets who were led by the Lord to reveal the coming of Christ. As a matter of fact, the word revealed, which is found there in verse 12, well, it's translated from the Greek word apocalypto. This word refers to the unveiling that results in the revelation that, uh, of something that was previously covered. For, for example, like when a sculpture artist removes the sheet from the statue that was previously covered so that we can look upon all, all the beauty of that new statue, right? And, and so the, the removing of the sheet, that is revelation. It's a revealing of what was previously covered. Well, it's in a similar yet spiritual way that the Lord used the Old Testament prophets to remove the sheep, so to speak. The Lord used the Old Testament prophets to reveal the details regarding the time and the circumstances surrounding the suffering of our Savior. Now, that word sufferings, it's found there at the end of verse 11. It's translated from the Greek word, which was used in reference to the evil afflictions that result in the pain of persecution. And, and not only that, but this is the, also the same Greek word that Paul used in Hebrews chapter two, when he referred to the suffering of death that Christ Jesus endured on our behalf. And so this word sufferings, it's, it's in this context pointing to the death of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Old Testament prophets, they, they had already, by the, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, they had already revealed the suffering of the Savior, which would result in the death of our Redeemer. And certainly we find in the Old Testament prophecies about the death of our Messiah. Not only that, but we should also notice there at the end of verse 11, where Peter tells us that the prophets not only revealed the sufferings of Christ, but also the glories that would follow. That word glories... Well, it comes from a Greek word which was used to describe the kingly majesty of the Messiah. It's also a word that refers to the most glorious condition of the exalted state that the Lord Jesus received after his resurrection. And at the time of his resurrection and then ascension into heaven, he was restored to the same glory that he had with God the Father before the earth was. With that being the case, then we see that the Old Testament prophets were led to reveal the incarnation the crucifixion, as well as the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is precisely the point that our risen Lord Jesus was making in Luke 24. This was after his resurrection from the dead, and, and he traveled with a, a few of his disciples who were debating and doubting whether Jesus was the Savior or not. And, and then he chimes in on this conversation, and, and in Luke 24, verse 25, he says, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered, speaking of his death, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, his glorious state after the resurrection? Well, then after asking this question to these disciples, Luke goes on to tell us that Jesus, he begins with the writings of Moses and all of the Old Testament prophets, and he expounded to them in all the scriptures, speaking of the Old Testament, all the things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus gave these guys an Old Testament Bible study. He opened up the writings of Moses, the Torah. He opened up the Old Testament scriptures written by the prophets, and he began to show them everything that they had written about the sufferings of the Messiah and the glory that would follow. Now imagine sitting in on that Bible study. It would have been incredible to listen to our risen Savior teaching an Old Testament Bible study on the promises that point to the Messiah. With all this in mind, let's continue to consider Peter's point about uh, the way that the Old Testament prophets revealed the sufferings as well as the glory that would follow. And what does that mean to us now? Well, with this question in mind, look with me there again, again at verse 12. Here again, Peter writes, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. Therefore, 
Therefore, because of all these Old Testament prophecies and because this has all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, therefore what? Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Here in these verses, we find Peter helping his audience to understand that the Lord used the Old Testament prophets to reveal the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus so that we might have all the proof we need to believe and receive the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Sadly, though, our carnal minds will always lead us to look for hope in something other than the resurrection. We want to find hope in this world. We want to find hope in, in, in some new position at work. We want to find hope in some new form of, of, of monetary income. We want to find hope in some new relationship. We want to find hope in the people around us. We want to find hope in our family. We want to find hope in all these things that will always let us down. And when that which we're hoping in lets us down, then we're crushed and we grieve. And We ought not hope in these things. We ought to hope in the revelation of Jesus Christ, in the revealing of the Lord Jesus, which will occur at the time of his second coming. And it's for this reason that, that Paul writes in verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, get a hold of your thought life, he says. Quit allowing your mind to lead you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Quit, quit allowing your mind to lead you to hope in something other than in the resurrection of Jesus. Grab a hold of your thought life and put your hope in the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this way, we can become obedient believers who are living in submission to our Savior, Jesus. Jesus. Get a hold of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that will be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I like the way that the scholars who gave us the new international version of the Bible rendered verses 13 and 14. They put it like this. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Now the word obedient found there in verse 14, it's translated from a Greek word which speaks of submission. It speaks of compliance. And while I'm sure that we all know kids who struggle with obedience, uh, there are also many parents who understand the importance of giving their kids the right motivation so that they might become more obedient. Now, some kids are motivated to obey by the threat of punishment. But most, if not, I would even argue all children are motivated to obey by the promise of reward. I mean, what kid doesn't want to be rewarded for their obedience? When I was a kid, I was certainly someone who struggled to obey, and I know you find that hard to believe, but it's true. I struggled to obey, and as a result, I, I was constantly misbehaving. I was constantly breaking the rules. I was constantly pushing the, the limits. And, and, and you better believe that, that my bad behavior made it very difficult for my mom. And it, and it made it difficult for her to accomplish simple tasks like grocery shopping. Now you can just, you know, send your order to the grocery store, and they'll put it all together for you. You drop by, they bring it out to the curb, and, and you drive off, right? But, but back then, I mean, moms actually had to go into the grocery store. And they had to wrestle their kids around with the shopping cart and all these sorts of things. And, you know, I was a handful. And my mom began to take some time on the way to the grocery store. She would take the time to, to have a little uh, motivation seminar with me. And she would motivate me to obey by promising uh, a special treat if I behaved myself, you know. And, of course, special treat, you know, that was always something sweet. Chocolate or hostess fruit pie or something. And it, would, it helped, you know, it helped. It, it gave me something, a reason to want to obey. Then as I started acting up in the store, as I always did, she would stop me and remind me, remember, there's a reward if you behave. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it would get me back on track. 
It was those reminders that helped me to remember that there's going to be benefits for good behavior. 300 pounds later, I, I became the most... No, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's in a similar sort of way that Peter here is reminding his readers about the gracious rewards that are promised to those who walk in obedience. He's reminding his readers about the, the rewards that we will receive on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed, which is at the time of his return. And with this as our goal, he encourages every believer to become obedient children. He's saying become submissive to our Savior, become compliant to Christ. And we do this by denying the depraved desires that lead us back into a life of lustful disobedience. Well, it's true that our fallen flesh is constantly calling us to conform our lives to the lusts of this world. It's also true that the reward of the Lord will provide us with the motivation we need to continue walking in obedience, which is why we need to continue to remember the resurrection and the rewards that we will receive at that point in time. And in order to further make my case, I want to remind you of something that Jesus said, it's Revelation chapter 22, where he declares, he who is holy, let him be holy still. Or in other words, if, if you've been covered with holiness, continue to walk in holiness. And then in verse 12, he says, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. He's got rewards for Christians and he's going to reward us according to what? Every kid gets a trophy? No. Nope. No, he's not rewarding snowflakes for, for being special. He's, re re he's going to reward Christians for being obedient. There's coming a day when the Lord Jesus will return. He's going to establish his millennial kingdom. And it's at that point in time that he's going to reward the good works of every born again believer who set out to serve him and submit to him and comply to his commands. Therefore, if you've placed your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, set your sights on the goal. Keep your eyes on the prize of the upward call. And with this as our focus, we must realize that the upward call of God is to walk in holiness today. That's what he's calling us to today, to walk in holiness. Let's consider how Peter puts it again here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look with me again at verse 15. Here Peter declares, he who called you is holy. In other words, God is holy. So what? Well, so you also be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. That word holy speaks of those who have been cleansed of sin and set apart for God. That's exactly what happens to us when we repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are made holy. We are cleansed of our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of the stain of sin. God the Father imputes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ and therefore we're covered in the holiness of Jesus Christ. We, at that moment, receive positional holiness as our lives are hidden in Christ Jesus, but now we're being called to walk in practical holiness. We've been made positionally holy by the imputation of righteousness, but now we are told to walk in that holiness. And so he says, be holy. Be holy. For I am holy. Our life ought to be a reflection of the holiness of God. Now that's a, that's a tough order. And I'm having flashbacks to the grocery store with mom. Because around every corner was one more opportunity to disobey my mom. Down every aisle was just one more opportunity to misbehave. And that's exactly what life is like. Every day we wake up and what's before us, but hundreds and hundreds of opportunities to disobey God. And what's even worse is that our flesh is extremely weak and ready to give in to sin. And yet the spirit is willing and ready to give us the strength that we need 
to walk in obedience so that we can be practically holy as we are positionally already. Therefore, I would conclude this study by reminding you about the, the Masonic motivation that we need each and every day. And it's a motivation that comes from the focus that we should place on the resurrection revelation. That there's coming a day when we will stand before our Savior. We've been given the promise of resurrection and the promise of resurrection should motivate us to now walk in holiness. Christian, listen, the promise of resurrection, it reveals the hope of our inheritance, which has been guaranteed to those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, let's set our sights on the promise of the resurrection so that we can have a heart that's filled with the right hope. The promise of resurrection also reveals the joy of endurance, which then helps us to realize that uh, the trials of life aren't meant to hurt us, but rather the Lord is using the trials of life to purify us and to perfect our faith. Therefore, those who set their sights on the promise of the resurrection are able to endure every difficulty and, and we can endure with great joy. Finally, the promise of the resurrection reveals the goal of obedience and, and this helps us to remember that the Lord, he's promising to reward the believer who spends their life serving our Savior with the obedience that brings glory to him. And so with this as our goal, I encourage you, let's continue to set our sights on the resurrection revelation. Let's continue to look forward to the day when we will receive our resurrected bodies, when we will stand in the presence of our resurrected Savior. And as we set our sights on the resurrection revelation, the Lord will then give us his resurrection power so that today we can walk in a way that is pleasing to him.